Alright. Um, hi, Assalamualaikum and a very good evening to our audiences in Malaysia. Um, and um, good day to everywhere else that's tuning in. Um, I, I am Sumaya. I am uh, the Learning Solution Specialist with Microsoft Malaysia. And uh, today we have our session with the My Digital Make You Fair Virtual Fair for 2020 uh, for the Microsoft uh portion of the uh, exhibition of the My Digital Maker Fair event. So tonight we have a very special person um, tuning in all the way from the United States, uh, which is Sonia De La Fosse, which is my favorite person in Microsoft. Uh, she is our global um, educator program manager uh, for Microsoft. Uh, she's the one, the the, the person behind all of the Microsoft Innovative Educator programs um, and also, you know, the uh, inaugural events that we have every year, which is the educate, uh, Education Exchange. Um, and I am excited to be able to have her in our session today. Sonia has been with Microsoft for five and a half years. And prior to that, she has been in the education uh, scene for about 21 years. So, um that's why we are delighted that she's able to spare time, uh, her valuable time with us tonight. And um, with that, I uh, pass the floor up to you, Sonia. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. <laughs> or no, good evening. It's super late for you. For me, it is six o'clock in the morning and I am really excited to be here. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I have, as my said, I've been at Microsoft for five and a half years, and I spent 21 years as a teacher, as a professional development specialist, as an assistant principal, and finally a technology coordinator, all for public schools here in Washington State, which is on the other side of the U.S. from Washington, D.C., um, so in the Seattle area, um, and I absolutely love my job today. I get to work with teachers and schools all over the world, including all of you. Um, you are what makes, gets me up in the morning. Um, I actually have a music degree, which a lot of people don't know. I majored in clarinet and classical clarinet um, and then teaching as well. So when I taught, I taught uh, music. I taught choir. I taught maths. Uh, I taught technology, um, and then I also got my master's to become a principal, because here in Washington State, to become a principal, you have to go get your master's degree, um, and then I really, the reason I came to Microsoft, because I've deployed lots of tools from lots of different companies, if it's out there, I probably trained a teacher on how to use it, <laughs> and I just fell in love with OneNote. OneNote changed my life when I was um, in grad school specifically. It really got me as a student through grad school. And I wished that OneNote existed when I was a math teacher. It would have dramatically changed my life. And uh, the thing I love about Microsoft is just all the really innovative, amazing tools that keep coming out from our engineering team because they listen to teachers. And it makes me very proud. I'm very proud to work at Microsoft um, my favorite learning path in Mac right now is a brand new learning path that I helped create called Hybrid Learning Strategies for Success. So if you haven't checked that out today, you should definitely do that. And the things that keep me going, a couple quotes that stick in my head are that failure is not an end, it's an opportunity to learn. And how we deal with failure and use it to help us grow is what matters. And the second one is that at the end of the day, people aren't going to remember what you said or what you did, but they will remember how you made them feel. And if you think back to the people in your life, you either have good feelings about them or bad feelings about them. And it's just so that I take, I try to live with those kind of two things in mind as well as many other things. Um, so today, <clears throat> uh, this is kind of our agenda. Um, I'm going to do a welcome to all of our new MIE experts. I'm so excited. Um, talk about what the Microsoft Educator Center can do for you. Do an overview of our innovative educator programs. Talk about a really amazing virtual event that all of you were invited to in April. And then if you've reached the top and you're an MIE expert and you're a fellow, what could you do next? 
And then, of course, we'll open it to questions and answers, and Sumaya will be um, moderating that. So I'm really excited to get going. So again, this goes to my personal core value, and it's always been really important for me to work for an organization who matches how I feel. And uh, at Microsoft, we're founded on the principle that people can do remarkable things when technology is in our reach. And our mission at Microsoft is to empower every student and every teacher on the planet to achieve more. That's why we're here. We want you to be the best you that you can be. Uh, so with that, I wanted to begin by welcoming, we have a special program called the Microsoft Innovative Educator Expert Program. And I just want to give a big congratulations to the, I think it's 216 of you in Malaysia who have worked really hard to demonstrate that you're innovative, that you're using technology to really improve student outcomes, that you go beyond just your own students by teaching other teachers by uh, moving your whole school forward and becoming kind of a mentor to other teachers around Malaysia and even around the world. So this is kind of what our Innovative Educator Expert Program looks like around the world. Uh, we have nearly 20,000 of them, but 216 in Malaysia. So it's quite a, as you, it's quite a big program. You can see Malaysia even has more than Canada has. Um, more than Germany. Uh, so you guys are doing amazing, amazing work in Malaysia. And I've been fortunate to be in Malaysia three or four times. I can't remember. And I absolutely have valued every moment I've gotten to spend there, the schools I've visited, the teachers I've talked to. Um, Malaysia is a very special place to me. And so I'm thrilled to be here with you. So with our programs that I manage, um, it's really founded on the idea that the research shows that outside of a student's family, teachers have the greatest impact on student outcomes. So therefore, it's so critical that teachers have really good professional development. I don't care if you're adopting a new reading curriculum or a language curriculum or a maths curriculum or a new technology. 71% uh, of educators, and I felt this when I was a teacher, that adoption of new initiatives without proper training or professional development is the biggest reason for feeling stressful. And I think the whole world felt that this year when suddenly in March, everyone around the world, all teachers, suddenly found themselves having to figure out remote teaching and learning, trying to teach in a whole new way that they've never experienced. And what I was really proud to see was that the teachers rolled their sleeves up and said, you know what, I'm going to do this and it's not going to be the best. I might make mistakes but I'm going to learn from them. And so um, at Microsoft, we worked really hard with our Microsoft Educator Center. So hopefully you guys have been to the Microsoft Educator Center. It is free, robust professional development to support your learning wherever you are, whether you're brand new to a tool or you're an experienced teacher who's been using technology for a long time. And um, what we also believe is that you shouldn't be learning on your own. If you're just sitting at home taking courses on your own, that's great. But better would be if you have a collaborative professional learning group and you take courses together and you discuss them and maybe even take the quiz together. I've seen uh, really successful examples where teachers actually take the course. They all have their laptops and they're either doing it remotely through Teams or in face-to-face -face times, they would do it face-to-face -face, um, and they would sit there and take the course together and they would talk about each module. And then when they take the quiz, they'd take it together and talk about it. And that's not cheating. That's, that's collaborative learning. And so uh, I really think that's the way that I've seen MEC, as we call it, most powerfully uh, used by teachers. So in MEC, we have courses, uh, and you can see a courses here on the right, the Transform Learning with Microsoft Teams. Our courses have objectives. Many of them are tied to standards. 
Um, once you get into a course, uh, the very small screenshot on the bottom right, you can see there's lots of modules. So the thing I, I actually did this a lot um, is there's, for example, when I was learning branching and forms, there's a module on that and I could never remember how to get it started again. So I'd launch the course again and I would just use that table of contents to find the piece that I wanted to relearn. So you can take a course, even after you've completed it, you can get back into it and use that content. Uh, our learning paths are collections of courses that help you uh, get more mastery over the, the topic. And the nice thing about a learning path is it's laid out for you in a specific, a suggested order. You can do it in any order you want, but that's the suggested order. And as you complete them, you can see I have a green check mark next to the courses I've completed. And you can see the score I earned on the exam. And you can see there's a little button that says retake course. So it'll always say that you've completed it, but you can get back into it at any time that you want, which I think is really important. Uh, the other things that MEC has is it has uh, a page when if you click my profile, you'll see all of the badges. And when you click view details on any of those badges, uh, so you can see I have those three badges across the top and below each one there's a little blue link that says view, t view details. Those details will be your certificate that you can download. There'll also be links so you can share what you did on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter. And then we also have transcripts for you that just show you everything you completed, when you completed it, and how long it was. And that's really important because lots of uh, teachers around the world need to show that they're continually learning to uh, keep their teaching certificate. So once a teacher is in MEC, the first kind of goal is to complete two hours of content. And once you've completed two hours of content by passing the quizzes at the end of the course, or uh, we have lots of training partners uh, and MIE trainers who also can deliver this content. Uh, and if they've delivered a content and given you a special code, once you've done two hours of content, you earn your MIE badge. And you can see that badge on the top left corner of this slide. And since 2016, we've had 1.2 million people around the world become an MIE. And I would say what's amazing is almost half of those were in the last year because of the shift to remote teaching and learning. Teachers suddenly were really looking for meaningful training um, to help them adapt to this new world we're in. Um, and I've seen, too, schools and school systems who include MEC as a part of their holistic plan actually are more likely to have strong adoption by teachers. And where I've seen it really successful is when it's a school's goal to have 100% of their teachers as at least MIEs, and they maybe have two or three MI experts leading the way. Trainers. Uh, and you can be an MI expert and become a trainer, or you could be a trainer and not an MI expert. It's They're not like one's not above the other in any way. Um, they're educators, government or district trainers, professional development specialists, anybody who is responsible for training educators and school leaders. And you can either do an in-person trainer academy or an instructor-led trainer academy uh, that maybe somebody in Malaysia is delivering that. Um, but if not, there's the online trainer academy that you can take. And that's one of our learning paths. So you go into the learning paths and you look for the trainer academy. And if you commit to reporting uh, 100 educators per year, and that could be like, let's say you do like a Teams call with five teachers and you spend 30 minutes teaching them about getting their first team site set up. You could report that. Um, <clears throat> and you don't need to be an expert to become a trainer. Um, but I love it when my experts also become trainers. <clears throat> so down here at the bottom, the aka.ms MIE trainer uh, will take you to that learning path. And then the edgy track is the reporting tool we have. And then finally, we have a really robust LinkedIn group as well, filled with thousands of trainers sharing best practice. 
Uh, once a teacher has used edutrack.microsoft.com, uh, they can create, uh, before you do a training, you want to go into this tool and set, say that you're doing a training ahead of time. So let's say I was doing a training this Friday. Today, I might go in and say I'm planning on doing a training on Friday. I'm guessing that there's going to be about 30 people, so I'm probably going to say 40. I can go back in and change it afterwards. Um, and then I get a code that I can give to my participants. And when my participants redeem that code on Mech, they get a little, it shows up in their transcript. So you can see it's custom training. It shows up as custom training. And then the tools that we're trained on show up here. Um, so that's really awesome. That's one way we've actually tied. So when you get an instructor led training, you get it recorded on Mac if the, if the achievement codes are used. And of course we have our innovative educator experts who I am very proud of in Malaysia. The 216 of you that have re reached this status have worked really, really hard. Um, they're self driven educators who are passionate about teaching and learning inspiring students with creative thinking. They're teaching in the 21st century style. They're coming up with innovative ways to engage students using lots of different styles of engagement. Sometimes maybe doing flip grid assessments, maybe using Kahoot or Wakelet, maybe um, using forms, They're maybe using video where the students uh, actually one of the most innovative Things I heard last year was a math teacher from Sweden, when uh, suddenly he found himself teaching his students remotely, he decided he was going to actually assess his students differently in maths. And what he did was he assigned each student a problem. So each student had a different problem. And the student had to screen record themselves solving the problem. And then they had to record their voice explaining what they were doing. And that's what they submitted. And so with that one question, he could tell when they were explaining if they understood the concept or not, or how soon they were getting off track. And I think that is one of the most powerful ways that I think technology and maths can be a big difference. Because I always told my students when I taught maths, I can't see inside your head. You have to explain on paper what you did. Um, and I think even then, students really struggled sometimes explaining on paper. So using something like Flipgrid or PowerPoint recording or OneNote um, makes a massive difference in helping students process their thinking. Uh, so it's I encourage all of you to aim to become a Microsoft Innovative Educator Expert. It's a difficult um I would say it's very high level to achieve this status. You have to really not just only be an amazing teacher, but you have to be someone who's coaching the other teachers around you that you maybe you're, maybe you've also set up your own YouTube channel or your tweet. and sharing best practice with other teachers around Malaysia and maybe even around the world. So it's not just about what you're doing in your classroom, it's what you're doing for teaching and learning as a whole. So um, what do my experts do? They've adopted, like I said, 21st century teaching and learning. They take risks. They strive to improve their pedagogy. Uh, they see our community as being very valuable, and so they contribute to the community. I, uh, I always say you get from the community what you give to the community. So if you just sit in the corner, just kind of watching the people in the community talk to each other and you don't participate, you're not going to get a lot out of it. And my experts uh, are a leader in their school and their school system. They provide coaching and mentoring they partner with principals and school leaders in whole school transformation. They're comfortable presenting in front of other educators and leaders and sharing stories of growth and learning. And they look for ways to give back to the teaching profession. Because I think as a teacher, it's really important that it's not just about your own students, that you see all the students in your school as your students. 
You see all the students in the country as your students that you can impact. That's really how I came to be here. I, you know, I impacted my 150 students I had each year and I wanted to do more. So I became a professional development specialist and worked with 2000 teachers. And then from there, I wanted to become an a principal. And so I can affect all the teachers, like the whole like transformation of a school. And then from there, I wanted to be a technology coordinator of a school system so I could transform a whole school system. And now I get to work here, hopefully making a difference for students all over the world. So um, it's definitely, and I was an MI expert in the first year it ever existed. So uh, I think it was 2013, 2014. Fellows. Uh, fellows are the top MI experts. And so for every 200 MI experts, there's probably one or two fellows, maybe five. Um, they are the country's most trusted and valued educators. Uh, they are a dedicated group. They are actually the leaders of the MI expert group in that country. Uh, in the U.S., the fellows actually run the monthly calls. So uh, the United States has broken their MI expert group into like 10 what they call cohorts that are spread across the U.S. And each cohort is responsible for developing the content and leading the monthly call for the MI experts. Um, and their mentors to so the MI experts feel like they can ask them questions, um, get some extra help from them. So our educator timeline kind of looks like this. From May through July is our recruitment window. Um, we do reviews July through the end of August. We announce the cohort at the end of August, and then we run, there's, you'll see uh, local webinars in Malaysia being led by Malaysia, uh, monthly MI expert calls happening in Malaysia. And then what's coming in April is what I'm going to talk about next is our virtual education exchange. So even if you're not an MI expert this year, because we've gone virtual, we're going to invite you to our virtual E2. E2 is usually our premier face-to-face -face event that only 350 teachers get to come to each year. And this last year was supposed to be in Sydney, but then COVID happened. So we're on a postponement until we can actually go back to face-to-face, -to -face, but we don't know when that's going to be. So we decided let's go virtual. So um, in E2, uh, we're going to probably actually November, we're going to announce a challenge for all our MI experts and showcase schools uh, that they can do. Um, November through February, MI experts and fellows will be able to complete, complete and submit their challenge. Um, and then the finalists will move forward to global judging. And then we have three days in E2 and we're going to be offering E2 at three different times, so you guys can choose the time that works best for you. Um, day one is just a one-hour session. I will have MIE experts and showcase school leaders and inspirational speakers and Anthony Salcedo. And day two will um, be breakout sessions. So there'll be all kinds of breakout sessions that you can choose from throughout the day for further learning. And then day three is going to be our award ceremony, um, closing keynote and a big celebration. So that's really exciting. The other thing I wanted to point out was, and I'm inviting my MI experts in Malaysia who are not part of this program. Um, if you are an MI expert and you're not in this program and you're interested in joining it, it's totally voluntary, you don't have to. Um, just ask Samaya and she'll, I'll help her get you guys up and running, but we know that teachers a lot of times want to just ask another teacher a question. So we have this program in which we, we leverage the Skype in the classroom uh, tool system platform and teachers can go in and look for an educator in their country or in a different country and set a one on one tutoring session up with them. It's been really successful. And then the last thing that I just wanted to share before we go into Q&A is um, the other thing that's once you as an MI expert 
have really helped your school leader transform the school and all of your teachers are using teams and using OneNote and have done whole school transformation, uh, your school can become what's first called an incubator school. And then as an incubator school, you can work your way up to becoming a showcase school. And we have a lot of showcase schools around the world again. Um, and I just wanted to say welcome to all the schools that are showcase schools. And um, there are a few in Malaysia as well. And so um, this is what it takes to become a showcase school, a commitment to transform, a culture of learning and growth. So you can see that 60% of the educators and the leaders have a MEC profile, at least 25% of their MIEs um, or certified or the MCE and 3% are experts. There's personalized learning and inclusion. They're actively working on developing future ready skills. They're using data to create decisions. And finally, you can see that 60% of the students, staff and teachers are using Teams. 90% of the students and teachers are using Office 365 and at least 60% of the devices are Windows. So when all six of those pieces have been met, that's when a school can um, move from incubator to showcase. And so here we go, we've got 12 showcase schools in Malaysia. Um, you're really excited about that. You can see it's hard to become a showcase school. There's only 328 of them around the world. We have another, like I think 400-ish um, <clears throat> incubator schools. So we have 400 schools who are working themselves towards becoming a showcase school. But yeah, so that is all about our engagement programs we have. Uh, and now I'd just like to um, turn it back to Samaya um, to moderate a Q&A. All right. Um, so we do have a question uh, that came in from uh, Michael Harvey. Um, he did ask about the uh, the challenge earlier, the E2 challenge. Um, is it possible for him to do it uh by pairing with another teacher um, and then uh, yeah so basically let's just go to that question first yes absolutely you can totally do it with another teacher um, we're going to announce it I'm working on actually um, right now I know that we're going to get so many um, nominations that one of the things that I'm working on is actually building a tool where um, when people submit their challenge and they answer all the questions that um, we'll be able to kind of use some artificial intelligence to help us surface the best um, challenge submissions to the top. Because if we get a few thousand <laughs> submissions, asking a human to go through all those is going to be rough. So, um, so that's what I'm working on right now. So as soon as we have that tool um, designed and deployed and all that, then yes. And you'll absolutely be able to do it with one or two other teachers. If you wanted to do a team of three, I'm fine with that. A team of four, I'd be fine with that as well. So, yes. Hi, Michael, by the way. Okay. I hope your presentation went well. <laughs> All right. So, it, it is a very, I mean, everyone knows each other in our community. Yeah. All right. So, um, another question uh, that came through is that um, the incubator uh, showcase school program, um, that, does it have any um, deadline in terms of when do we graduate a incubator school to a showcase school? No, um, in our calendar. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe so. I think. I mean, because everyone progresses at a different pace. Um, what matters is reaching the, and that makes sense, right? We don't. I what was the? Oh, yeah. So here's a great. Uh, I, one of my teacher friends on Facebook posted this, and they said, you know, I don't know if you in Malaysia ever do popcorn, but popcorn, the old-fashioned way you cook popcorn when I was a child was. You put the dried kernels in a pot with oil and you're shaking it over the stove. And then one by one, the kernels pop. And my friend posted, you know, popcorn kernels, they're all the same. They're in the same pan using the same heat, but they don't all pop at exactly the same time. Yet we expect our students to. So students grow at different paces and different rates and schools grow at different paces and different rates. And so if it takes 
one school a year to become a showcase school. It could take a school three years. Um, it's really about those, and um, maybe I'll just back this up really fast, um, just hitting these, uh, sorry, I'm trying to back up, hitting these things. So maybe when you start as an incubator school, you've got like one and two and three done but you're working on four, five, and six, or maybe you have six and three and five and you're working on one, two, and four. So it's really about once all six of those, and we know that the time it takes is different for different school systems. Great question. All right. So, um, and then there's another more technical question. Um, as we know that uh, there are still a lot of teachers that are sending in um, their nomination to become uh, MIE experts. And uh, for those who has missed the, basically, um, Beyond has uh, submitted their submission beyond um, the, what was our deadline previously, August uh, deadline, um, when can they expect to get their <laughs> MIE badge on a claim? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. So if you've been accepted into the program and you were accepted after like September 1st, um, I actually have, that's one of my to-dos this week because I have to download, <laughs> I literally do this myself. I download the list. I make sure all the data is good because what I discovered is a lot of teachers sometimes mistype their names or they mistype their email address. And then I actually physically upload the list to a claim. And so um, that's my to-do for this week. So by the end of this week, anybody that was accepted, um, by October 1st, or probably actually October 5th, because I haven't downloaded the list yet, um, should have an email from a claim to claim your badge. And if not, we actually have um, a help site, um, which is aka.ms forward slash M-I-E-E support. And I have a two or three people that respond to questions and they can look in to see what your status is. And they can, if you accidentally gave us the wrong email address, we can change that in a claim. So um, yeah, we were very surprised to have double the amount of MI experts this year. And it's been, um, it's definitely added a lot of workload to us. And so we're doing the best we can trying to get through and make sure everyone's all taken care of because we do care very much about each one of you. Yes, yes, very much. I would like to echo that the workload is double this year. Um, yeah, and I, I would like to also apologize to the MIE teachers in Malaysia. It's just, there's been a bit of a delay getting them on our team's uh, group. So I, I've just added them over the weekend. So um, the activities are upcoming <laughs> also on my end. All right, so um, the next question, um, how to encourage teachers to use Microsoft in school? Um, I would say it's about the students. So when you think about, do you have 100% of your students engaged? Do you have 100% of your students progressing in their learning? If not, then it's about finding something that helps you personalize the learning, something that maybe takes a little workload off of yourself. And so when I was a teacher, I found that like learning technology took a lot of my time to learn it. Once I had it, it took away so much time uh, from like other things that had been eating up a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. And so like, I think Flipgrid is the easiest place to start. If uh, you don't even know where to start, Flipgrid um, is a great tool to, for student engagement. It can be used in so many different ways. Um, to hear the voices of all your students. And the other thing that I would say is don't use the same tool again and again and again and again, because students will wear, get tired of using the same tool. I mean, obviously Teams, think of Teams as like the hub. And honestly, I cannot imagine my life without Teams today. Um, it's so much better at helping a class stay organized. And the teachers that have mastered Teams are finding it integral to their class organization. They use insights to see who is 
actually engaging. That's the other thing that's really amazing. Uh, when you were in the, when I was in the face-to-face -face classroom, you'd always have like the same five students raising their hand. And it was really easy for students to hide until you finally did an summative assessment and then saw that they were in trouble with their learning. And so I think, think about, it's really about the students. All of us went into teaching because we wanted to make a difference for every student. Even the students that make it hard to care about them, they need your love the most. Mm -hmm. So think about, is there something you can do? And I would suggest absolutely teams. Uh, it's really hard. It's a steep learning curve, but that's because it's so complex. I found the more complex the tool is, the harder it is to learn. But once you've learned it, the bigger of a difference it makes. That's like one note too. One note's so complex with all the things you can do with it. But once you have it down, it's life changing. So for me as a student, I was super disorganized. Like I, my mom, I had a mom and dad who helped me at home. And, you know, I had a very lovely childhood <laughs> and my mom would try to help me get my work organized. And by the time I get to like school, I don't know where it went. Uh, I was, so I didn't get perfect grades, not because I wasn't learning, but because I was disorganized. And so when I discovered OneNote as an adult, I finally found the tool that helped me as a learner stay organized and that made all the difference. And it was actually in grad school that I went and I was all excited to have OneNote as a student in grad school. And I went into my psychology statistics class, my statistics class, and I pulled out my laptop and I had my OneNote ready to start taking notes. And the professor goes, laptops are not allowed in this class. You need to put them away. Wow. You will be using paper and pencil. And I just went, we're adults. Like I was 30 at this time and I was stunned. I was just like, this is the tool that helps me as a learner and you're making me put it away. So I think um, thinking about each student has a different learning style and each student has something that will engage with them. And so having a variety of tools is really important. So start with Flipgrid, do some teams, maybe then do some OneNote and then slowly add to your tool bag, if you will, and um, take advantage of the Ask an MI Expert program. Take advantage of the MI Experts near you. They want to help you. Um, and so, and always keep it focused on student outcomes. Don't use a tool because it looks cool. Use a tool because it's going to make a difference. That's a good point there that um, where you pointed out, you know, putting it all in teams, there will not be any issue of, you know, forgetting where the links are, especially when you're moving from one technology to another to keep the students engaged, right? Yeah, So. Exactly. Right. So now the next question, um, and this is also a, a question that I've asked as well. Um, do you think it is important to encourage MI experts to become Microsoft certified educators by taking the exam? I say it just depends. And I say this as the person that <laughs> helped write the current exam. Um, it's great. The, the content is what's really, really, really good. So um, getting that 21 CLD OneNote, uh, it's, and it's all based on 21st century learning design. So that OneNote and the, the content in there is really, really, really good. And I think the thing that's the most important about it, like what I took away from it, and I used to do a lot of trainings for the teachers in my district around 21 CLD, was I would actually, and this is how I suggest doing it, take your time to become, to take the exam, Instead, spend your time on learning the content and applying it in your real job. Um, that's what's more important to me than passing an exam. But if you can apply it in your real job, you shouldn't have any problem passing the exam. So what I would do when I worked with teachers was I would say we'd start with um, and it's based on like six 21st century skills. So let's say we were doing the one on collaboration. So. It talks about collaboration from um, the like I don't know like no collaboration to the most rigorous form of collaboration. And what it lets you do is it lets you look at a lesson 
and think about what type of collaboration are you having your students do? And so it talks about, um, are they just working together? Are they sharing responsibility for their work? Mm. Are they making substantive decisions about the work? Um, and so when you learn the rubrics and you learn to apply them to your lessons to bump up the rigor of collaboration or the rigor of communication or whichever of the six things, that's what's super important. And once you're able to do that, then you'll rock the exam. So I would say take your time, learn how to apply it to because that's the whole purpose. The whole purpose is to improve your teaching and learning, not just to pass a test, right? Um, and so that's my suggestion. All right. Okay. So another one that came from um, Hevery, Hevery Danyang. Um, so he has a question um, and he would like to represent a rural school. So he said that uh, will be will there be one day that Microsoft team um, invents or come up with an application that can be applied as offline, um, generally being used for rural schools where schools uh, mostly bar barely have any good connectivity to the internet. Um, and then uh, as what I can see, um, he has learned and apply. Um, in his classroom, uh, Microsoft Tools, and um, he has found them to be very great for uh, ap application for young generation. So he's asking whether, you know, are we going to be expanding, I suppose, our offline offering uh, for our tools? I would say um, not a lot, but except for the fact that we do have OneNote, and OneNote works really well offline. And then the second you have connectivity, it pushes the changes. So OneNote's our main tool um, that's meant to be online and offline. And that's what I used because um, back when I was in grad school in 2008, <laughs> um, OneNote didn't function like it does today. It like lived on a special, like I had, anyway. Um, and so I would be offline working in OneNote, and the second I was connected to my server, then uh, the changes would sync up. So uh, I th OneNote's really our main tool for that, but I think what's more critically important, what Microsoft has been doing, is working, um, there's actually a team at Microsoft called Airband, and they've been working on something called um, White Space. And white space has to do with like radio frequencies mm -hmm. and it's about providing um, internet to people with no internet. Because I honestly, this is Sonia personally talking, internet is like the next water, right? It's every human that needs to have water and good access to water. And we still have lots of communities that don't even have that. Um, but I think the next piece, if for an, for people to become successful adults that have a lot of choice, the internet, I believe, is one of those kind of things that I think should be a basic human right because that's access to information. It's access to knowledge. It's access to um, other ideas outside of what you're raised with. And so um, I think when I was in South Africa, I was talking about like it's, I'm hoping, what I'm hoping beyond everything is that COVID is helping governments around the world see the importance of technology and see the importance of connectivity, and that governments are going to work to provide a broadband internet to every citizen in their country, and um, that technology isn't just a nice to have for schools, but it's a must have. So I think that's really where Microsoft is working really hard is working with governments, working with um, organizations, working with NGOs on how do we make that true for everyone. Yes, I, I, and that is, um, yeah, that's also what's happening uh, in Malaysia as well, that um, our government is looking at various ways um, to, you know, have this, to enable this at communities that are without internet connection. Um, but um, I would say that you know start off with the one note as, uh, as 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 the starting point for um, you know for the schools that are challenged with 
uh, low internet connectivity. Like what Sonia was mentioning, you can use it offline first and then as soon as you have connectivity, then it will sync the content um, with, uh, you know, the cloud and then you will be able to access it through um, any of your devices. And if you have OneNote in your class team, then you can also make sure that, you know, all of the notes that you are creating within your class teams will also sync with the rest of your uh, class. So maybe that's another that you can uh, look into about, uh, you know, focusing which to which tool to focus for schools with uh, connectivity issues, right? <laughs> All right. So um, there's uh, another one, um, pedagogy and content first before deciding what tools to use. Mm. So what do you think about that statement? 100% agree. Could not agree more. It's always about the teaching. Like I tell teachers, your first job is to love every student and to care for every student and let them know that they're loved and cared for because if they don't feel like they're cared for by you, they're never going to learn. So that's first. Secondly is pedagogy. How are you engaging? How are you assessing your students throughout the day? How do you know as an educator where your students are on that learning um, journey that they're on and how are you intervening with them? So absolutely, technology does not work and there's so much research that shows just dumping technology in a school doesn't make a difference. Um, it's about intentional application of technology to improve the pedagogy. So 100% agree. All right. So I suppose that is also why we are always leading with our, um, you know, the education, the the twenty uh, first CLD, right? So we are always leading with that. Exactly. That's why our MCE is about that. It's not. It's not about like just because you know how to use Teams doesn't get to make you a better teacher. <laughs> um, if you know how to use Teams with the right pedagogy, that's when you're going to be a better teacher. So. All right. Great. So. Um, they are all saying thank you uh, to your responses, Sonia. And um, I also want to highlight uh, another one of the schools, one of the showcase schools in Malaysia uh, is also saying thank you to the programs because um, because of the showcase school program that it, they are able to transition um, through the lockdown uh, smoothly. And um, I was just chatting with a teacher, Cikgu Fazli, yesterday. Um, he said even when now that we have our schools already open and uh, uh, the, the students and the, are attending school normally, um, they have already created the culture that whenever the teacher posted anything on Microsoft Teams, yeah. they, ha they would have at least 60% response rate coming from the, awesome. the students. So yeah. I would say that is digital transformation in action. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so they and really... Yeah, I was going to say, I really hope all of you, as you go back to face-to-face, -to -face, take the best of the online learning. And it's that, like, what I've heard every teacher say is that kids would speak up in a Teams chat or, and they'd never talk in class, but they'd suddenly be vocal. So it's helping students find their voice mm -hmm. and giving every student a place to share their voice. And so that's awesome. I love that story. Thank you, Samaya. Welcome. All right. So um, we do have a bit of time here, and um, but there's no more questions that come that are coming in. Um, is Maybe there any, with the yeah. time, everybody could, if they haven't yet, <laughs> create an account on Mac <laughs> and check out the private <laughs> learning courses. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, we okay. So. I'm glad that you point that out. I will be including that into uh, the, the content that we will um, localize next. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And then I also um, put, oh, perfect. Thanks, Sewell. Um, I found an article on the, an air band initiative that came out on September 1st so that, that um, Samaya and Zool will be sharing with all of you as well, that whole initiative that Microsoft's been working on to close the digital divide. It's, it's another reason why I feel very proud to work here. All right. Yeah, I, I, I just, I mean, this is the first time I'm hearing this initiative and it's awesome. Um, all right. So thank you for sharing. And another message from one of our audience, embrace hybrid learning. Um, you know, we need to um, really embrace 
the changes that are coming with our new normal. So, um, with that, Sonia, do you have, um, aside from checking out the um, the new content that you have on Mac, um, do you have any other, uh, you know, last um, your sure. message to, I would to share? You. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, don't be afraid to take risks. Don't be afraid to fail in front of your students and talk through how you use a failure as an opportunity to learn. Students will learn so much more about how to deal with failure if it's modeled for them and make it a part of the learning. Maybe where students reflect on weekly, like where's one thing that they felt kind of a failure? How did they work past it? Like resiliency. And so modeling resiliency as a teacher and modeling failure as an opportunity to learn and taking risks. I remember as a teacher, I would just get up in front of my students and say, hey, I just learned about this new tool, technology tool yesterday. I have no idea what I'm doing, but let's just try it. And the kids and I would work through it together. And I'm talking like 12 and 13 year olds. And they were gracious when they saw me respecting them as intelligent learners and not that I was above them. And I cared about their thoughts and I wanted to learn with them. That made a massive difference. So take risks, model learning from failure, model resiliency, and just love and care for your students. Awesome. All right. Um, so with that uh, great summary that Sonia has uh, left us with. Um, I would like to uh, again thank Sonia for taking you know time out of your precious <laughs> you know um, day and um, to 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 be joining us uh, tonight. And um, I really hope that our audiences who who are tuned in, um, you know, be able to take away uh, take away maybe one or one or two points at least right from the session yeah. and really put that into action um, for for the betterment of our, you know, to, to improve the way that we are um, approaching our classes daily. So, yeah. um, on behalf of the uh, My Digital Maker Fair and also my, my Microsoft Malaysia, um, again, thank you so much, Sonia, and it's always a pleasure having you with us.